I'd like to welcome you back to Now Faith TV Ministry Training School by Video Online. We have just really enjoyed having this outreach on the internet. I enjoy your responses, I enjoy your prayer requests, your testimonies. I just thank you for making it interactive. I enjoy the fact that we are reaching out to so many nations and as you share your vision with me and what God's doing in your lives and the small groups that you have, it is such an encouragement. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Tonight we're going to be talking about another very practical subject. Again, I'll say like the last two weeks, we're in transition. We're beginning to go from laying the foundation into more clearly how to minister to others. More clearly how to help others take their flesh to the cross, tear down their strongholds, or like tonight, deal with their emotions. Now, some of you may be wondering, when do we get to the deliverance part? <laughs> You've um, been faithful to buy your books, Transformation of the Inner Man, and you'll see that deliverance is there. In fact, one of our books, Deliverance and Inner Healing, um, just really goes into that in detail and also into areas that you might even consider uh, to be an area that would have a real diagnosis with it. Then next semester, and particularly the third semester, we're going to be going into healing emotions even more. Tonight is like the introduction to that, but um, I believe that anyone that's called to ministry, whether they're male or female, is going to have to know how to minister to women's emotions. So we'll go into more detail about that and how to heal victims of abuse and sexual abuse. Of course, that's men and women these days. And I hope for sure that you bought um, the Bait of Satan by John Bevere, because anyone that's in ministry knows the hardest part about it can be getting along with the other ministers, <laughs> learning not to take offense when Satan completely sets you up to take offense trying to get you off track. So I want us to start out in prayer tonight, knowing that we're going into another area that has to do with taking flesh to the cross and keeping um, us from getting into a place where we're set up to agree with demonic forces, to agree with the devil's lies, to agree with anything but God's truth. And we want to choose to make good choices, to choose to believe God's truth in every situation, and to choose to do what the Father says do. Amen? Well, sometimes our feelings make it hard to do that, especially if we, we let them become emotions. And, and by definition, an emotion is a feeling where you've attached a belief in a behavior. And a feeling is just a spontaneous thought that pops into your mind or a spontaneous sensation that just suddenly pops up in your body. And you can't help that if you suddenly feel cold or hot or suddenly feel anxious or tense. You might not be able to help that, but you can help um, and make good choices so that it won't become an emotion that has an ungodly belief or an ungodly behavior included in it. So, Lord, I just pray that tonight you'll give a supernatural revelation that we'll be able to understand the difference between natural, spontaneous feelings that just pop up and we really have no control of that sudden appearance of this feeling and our ability to exercise the fruit of the spirit of self-control so that we don't allow feelings to become emotions that are embedded with ungodly beliefs and ungodly behaviors. And I thank you that you're going to give each and every one of us the insight that we need, that we'll know how to apply your truth rightly, that we'll know how to discern ourselves and discern the body, that we will be able to be healed, body, soul, and spirit, as we choose to believe your truth, as we choose to exercise the fruit of the spirit of self-control and to believe that by the power of the spirit we can make choices and walk them out. Amen? I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit, for your spirit of wisdom and counsel and understanding and power and might that gives us the ability to do everything that you command us to do. And we come together to unite in our spiritual power and authority to cancel every agreement, every belief, every behavior that we have had that has lined up with the devil in any way that is lined up with lies or deception. And we cancel every assignment against us now, against our pet's possession and property, against everyone and everything that we care about. We say they're all canceled in the mighty name of Jesus. And we welcome you, Holy Spirit, your words of wisdom, words of knowledge, prophetic words, and the insights that you want to give us. And we'll give you a million thanks. We give you thanks 
when you um, chastise us even, because we know that you're a loving Father that accepts us where we are, you love us beyond measure, completely apart from our performance and our behavior and our beliefs, and yet you don't want to leave us the way we are, and we thank you. We come wanting to be transformed, wanting revelation, and wanting our minds to be renewed so that we can make good choices. We thank you, Lord. We give you thanks for your power and your presence and your anointing that breaks every yoke, and we choose to believe that we can be totally healed from head to toe, body, soul, and spirit, and that we can be absolutely free in Jesus. Amen? Amen. We choose to believe that we can walk in the Spirit, that you are in us to enable us to do everything the Father says to do, and to say everything the Father says to say, and that we will be victorious. We're more than conquerors, and that every demonic spirit has to bow at the name of Jesus, and that we can bring our flesh to you, and you will bring it to death. This is mission possible, and we thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you that you're for us. You can only act toward us in love. And that you make it all happen as you live the Christian life through us. Amen. Hallelujah. I'd like to ask you a few questions to begin with. And I'm going to be posting this as a little test when I send out the email. So just relax. Take a deep breath. You're going to have a test. <laughs> I'd like to ask you how you would handle, how you would advise someone if they came to you for ministry. Just picture yourself, you're in a little side room there after church, and they've asked you for ministry because they can't seem to handle their emotions, they don't know what to do with them, and I wonder what you believe. Where are you going to be coming from when this happens? For instance, would you be the one that would say, well, just stuff it for now, put on a happy face, knowing that if you don't express it, it will soon go away? Or would you tell them to confess that they're fine or okay until the confession feels like it's actually the truth? Would you advise them to act it out with violence against inanimate objects like pillows or <laughs> in order to weaken the negative emotions? Would you say what others want to hear or tell them to do what others want them to do, protecting their emotions, other people's emotions first? Would you advise them to make a quick decision that would take the pressure off <laughs> before anyone finds out what they're really feeling? Or would you advise them to just forget it, leaving the former things behind? That sounds spiritual, doesn't it? Jesus demonstrated how to handle emotions when he went into the Garden of Gethsemane, and I'm going to talk about that tonight and share with you five steps that he demonstrated that would be a good pattern for us. He's definitely qualified <laughs> to give us the pattern, and usually, though, when we're hurt, we don't follow the pattern that Jesus followed in the Garden of Gethsemane. When we get hurt, it's just as natural as it can be for us to blame other people and to judge them. Amen? Or, okay, well let me give you an example. Say you're walking through a meadow. Charlie shared this with us at the, um, at the school, at the Elijah House School. I thought it was a good example. Say you're walking through a meadow. It's like a perfect meadow. It's the most beautiful spring day that you ever saw. You're feeling so good. You're just skipping along and suddenly you hit, you kick a brick so hard in just the wrong way that it completely takes the toenail off your big toe, blood spurts out, and you are screaming with pain, what would you do next? Well, scream would be the first thing, yes. But what would you do next? What would you do with those feelings? What would you feel? Would you um, blame yourself and call yourself stupid? Would you get mad at God for allowing you to kick the only brick in the whole field? Would you curse at the brick? That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? <laughs> what would you do? Well, in the meantime, I hope you're holding pressure on your toe, because that's the nurse in me. <laughs> but usually when we're hurt, we blame or judge or get mad at something. Some people are so into anger that they really don't even recognize the wide variety of emotions that they feel. Everything comes out as anger, but that's not really all they're feeling. 
pain, the pain that you're feeling, in this case is physical pain, and it's the indicator that needs something needs to be done. But any time that we're feeling a strong feeling like that, whether it's emotional or physical or mental, when you're feeling a strong feeling, it's an indicator that something needs to be adjusted. Well, <laughs> obviously. But pain is actually a good thing. Without pain, we often wouldn't know that we were sick, that we need medical attention. We wouldn't know that maybe we need to set boundaries because people are trying to manipulate us and control us. Without pain, we might not know that what we're doing is wrong or that we're exposing ourselves to something harmful. But usually, we, we get angry, we judge, and we blame. We've talked about that enough already, so I'm going to go on to uh, another example. For instance, I like the example of there's a caution light in your car. When it comes on and says that your car needs service or your battery's almost dead or you're almost out of oil, you can get mad at the light. <laughs> you can judge the light. <laughs> You can curse the light. But the light is trying to help you, amen? It's trying to help you to know that you need oil, or you need fuel, or you need to check your car in some way and have it serviced. And so that light, like pain, is trying to help us to know that adjustment needs to be made. And so feelings that feel bad aren't, quote, bad. They're helping us to know that an adjustment needs to be made. Now, sometimes the feeling might feel like sin. Some of you are afraid that your feelings are so bad that they might even send you to hell. If you let me define what a feeling is versus what an emotion is, I believe I can convince you that your feelings will not send you to hell. So you, can, you can rest at ease. A feeling often is just a physiological response. It's something in your body. Like the first second that you're even feeling lust, it's a physiological response. Your body responds to something or someone that's attractive. But it doesn't mean that you have sinned yet. A feeling is something that can come out of the autonomic nervous system that you feel hot, you feel cold, you feel panic. But it doesn't mean that you've sinned yet. It's a spontaneous thing, a feeling. But we can't control that. We can't control if we suddenly feel tense, or we suddenly feel anxious, or we suddenly feel hard or cold, or we suddenly feel lust. But we can choose what we let become an emotion. Let me define that. An emotion is a feeling that we tie then to an ungodly or a godly belief, or we tie it to an attitude or a behavior that's either godly or ungodly. You know, the old saying that they say, a bird can fly over your head, but you don't have to let it make a nest in your hair. And when we, um, I think it was in the video of Dying That We Might Have Life, I believe, we talked about David, we talked about taking things to the cross, and we talked about when he first glanced at Bathsheba, he had not sinned yet. But sin, when it conceives, when, it's, when we're drawn away by lust, when we're enticed by it, and then we choose an ungodly behavior, then we're choosing an emotion that will be sinful because we're choosing a belief, like in his case, that he has a right to summon Bathsheba, another man's wife, to himself, and he has the right to act sinfully. So can you control your feelings? A lot of them you can't. You can't. They're just bodily responses. But... That's in the first few seconds. Then, as you allow time to be added to that feeling, as you allow an god ungodly belief, or you allow an ungodly behavior to be added to it, then it can become an emotion that actually involves sin. You might be thinking, well, I'm only human. And yes, all humans have spontaneous feelings. All humans will be tempted to lust after things. That's normal. Sexuality is good. Thinking or feeling sexual is good in the right context. We were created to be sexual. However, for instance, consider, well, let's consider the pattern that Jesus set. He is on his way to Gethsemane. I personally believe that he did not know every detail of what the next day or even that night held. He didn't know that he would be uh, not only put on trial, but six trials, that it would be like kangaroo court, that it would be held after hours, that it would all be done in the dark, 
um, without proper announcement, without proper people in attendance. He didn't know, I don't believe, exactly how he would die, but I believe he was beginning to get a sense from the father that it was going to be really, really rough. He knew the people that he was dealing with. He knew the modes of, of punishment in, in that day, and he knew about crucifixion, and I think he had a lot of questions on his mind, enough that it says that he called his friends, his closest friends, to go with him apart to a private place to pray. So what he did was instead of just sharing his emotions or his feelings with everyone, he chose select trusted friends. He asked them to come away to a private place to pray. This is an excellent model when you're overwhelmed with your feelings. He shared what was in his heart and he shared that he wanted them to stay awake with him, you know, to go with him and to pray. Now they weren't able to do that, but he asked for what he wanted. He took a risk of sharing in front of them his deepest emotions that he had ever felt in his life. He was up against um, what, he, what his feelings and emotions wanted and what he felt like the God Father was asking of him to be willing to lay down his life for us. He was up against the fact that he was sinless and perfect in himself and yet the challenge to take all of our sin, <laughs> of all sinners, past, present, and future on himself. What a burden. And he began to sweat, it says the Bible, the Bible says, great drops of blood. And you can be under so much pressure that your body will actually begin to sweat blood. I believe this is literal. I believe that he was crying out to God saying, I don't even know if I can do this. I certainly can't unless you help me. The Bible says he was tempted and always like as we are. So that means it was a real struggle, not a pretend struggle. It means that he persisted even though they fell asleep, even though they didn't really understand what he was going through, and he asked them again to listen to him and understand. So sometimes we can call ourselves trying to share what we're feeling with someone, but the first instance that we feel like they, they're not hearing us, you know, we may walk off. But Jesus persisted. He asked them to listen again. And he chose to do what his father wanted no matter what he was feeling, what his emotions were saying, he fully expressed his emotions, but he did not let them control his life. He did not make his decision based on his emotions. He understood that his feelings were valuable. He was not trying to stuff them or hide them or pretend that they weren't there or say it'll over be, be over soon, I'll just try to forget about it. But he poured his heart out to God. He poured his heart out to his best friends. Apparently they were <laughs> too sleepy and didn't hear it, but he still did the right thing. And what he was asking them for, and what we can ask people for, is active listening. I want you to really hear me, to hear what I'm going through, to share our heart honestly instead of pretend that we're not feeling what we're feeling. Because surely the devil could have told him, well, you're the son of God. You're not supposed to be um, thinking negatively about this or feeling negatively about this in any way. But he asked for support in the rough decision that he had to make. He asked for input, I believe. I believe that if they had been there praying with him awake, <laughs> that he would have received their input or received prayer. He made himself vulnerable, even though... He is the only sinless, perfect one that there has ever been. He was still willing to be vulnerable and to say it's not easy to be godly sometimes. It's not easy to make the right choices. It's not easy, especially to make them alone. And that's the reason that we need, when we're overwhelmed with feelings and emotions, to involve other people and to bounce these off of them. Especially trusted people. He didn't tell just everyone. He didn't tell the four or five thousand <laughs> or the hundred and twenty. He brought the inner circle aside to a private place. And he was looking to them for added strength. And we can get that from other people that are godly, that will support us in making right choices. I want to 
um, go on to say that it's the truth. It's when we choose to believe the truth that we really get free, even if our feelings are frantic. Even if our feelings, we just can't settle them down. Maybe his heart was racing. Maybe he was becoming physically weak <laughs> as he wrestled with the prospect of the most cruel death known to man. But the truth will set us free. The truth will give us strength. As, as we say, connected, um, one with the Holy Spirit. And when we are not honest, though, when we deceive ourselves, when we refuse to reveal to others where we really are, then confusion comes in. It makes it hard to make right choices, and it might make it hard for them to make right choices because we're not being real. We're not being honest about where we are. We're not being uh, truthful about the struggle that we're having, so we may not get the input that we really need. So what we need to do is to learn to tell the truth, to identify our emotions, not call everything anger, for instance, to share them with other people, to choose obedience, and as we label our struggle, struggle specifically, our emotions specifically, then they can help us. And then we can accept ourselves without condemning ourselves that this feeling has come to us, we want to choose to have the right emotion or the right belief or the right behavior. For instance, being real is like when someone asks you how you are and you know you're having a rough day and your challenges are big and formidable, <laughs> that when you choose to just say, I'm fine, or I'm good, or I'm okay, then you're not only deceiving them, you're not only validating your own emotions, you're not only not being honest, but you're making it difficult for them to even relate to you. If you choose to hide your emotions, to isolate from other people, to focus on things that aren't that significant right now as you're just escaping, to lie about the hurt and to say it doesn't hurt, this really doesn't help anyone. And when you go into deception, hiding your heart, putting on a mask, putting on a happy face, it's hard for others to know you. An example of this that a lot of us have experienced since childhood is maybe you're a little child, you hear your parent on the phone, say, talking to the other parent, but then they're arguing and they're fighting on the phone and you can't hear both sides of the conversation. So you're, you're wondering, what's going on, Mommy? Or what's going on, Daddy? If they say nothing, nothing, go to bed, everything's fine. See how confusing that is. It teaches a child that their perceptions aren't right that they're not able to discern, or it teaches them to lie about their feelings, or it teaches them that um, they're not really included in what's going on in the family. And while you don't include little children in major decisions, um, sometimes it's good to say, my, how perceptive you are. Yes, we are having a disagreement, but we will handle it, we will pray about it, and we will allow the Holy Spirit to treat us, um, to teach us and to guide us and to lead us, and we will know what to do. And so just that little bit of acknowledgement, letting the little child know that yes, something is going on, but we can handle it. Rather than tell them nothing is going on and go to bed when you know they're not going to be able to sleep when they've been um, told that nothing is going on, because they know that's not true. So what can we do? We can recognize that the feelings we have at first, they're, they're neither right nor wrong. It's just a spontaneous reaction, sometimes just a bodily sensation. We need to um, acknowledge and identify the feelings that we have and know when we try to suppress them or stuff them or hide them, that's not going to work. I like the saying that says there's no such thing as an unexpressed emotion. It will come out. It will come out when somebody pushes your buttons it will come out when something else triggers you that's similar. It will come out when you have to deal with someone else that reminds you of that person. But there's no such thing as stuffing an emotion uh, long term successfully. It is going to pop out. What can we do? Well, we can choose to express them to, in a safe place to people that we trust and honestly so they can help us make right decisions about our beliefs and our actions. We can, number two, we can begin to notice the degree or intensity of our feelings so that we'll know whether we can just um, seek a quiet time and deal with this ourselves, whether we need to stop and ask someone to take time to listen to us, 
whether we need to actually get help from a spouse or a friend or a counselor. And we need to be able to identify what emotion it is so that we can share with them and they can pray rightly for us. Amen. We need to learn to express our emotions to others. I mean, if you can't identify what emotion you're feeling, how are you going to be able to identify what the Holy Spirit wants you to do with it? One way to do that is when you're asking someone to pray for you, if they don't really understand the depth of what you're going through, you can paint a word picture for them. I love Smalley's book about communicating with word pictures because surely it's as you draw a picture, say, of a dog that's being kicked and, kicked and rejected after years of loyal service, so many of us can relate to word pictures. And especially people that aren't used to identifying their emotions, if you draw them a picture like that that they can identify with, they're going to be able to come alongside and listen and give you that strength and support quicker. Also, we need to stay away from generic words. When we want people's strength and support and prayer, we need to not just tell them everything's okay or fine or good or bad or sad or glad like a little child would. We need to go ahead and be honest and share with them. So what do we do? We don't need to just empty our our emotions and um, like you would empty a septic tank on the front lawn and just regurgitate over everyone. But we can do what Jesus did and choose select friends. We can go to a private place. We can share honestly. We can help them understand us. And we can make choices that are based on godly beliefs and godly behaviors. But what we need to do is don't let any negative emotion go unexamined. Know that they're like red flags that are in the ground. You know when you're going to dig or construction is going to happen and they want you to know where the gas line is, <laughs> and they put those little flags in the ground, and, and basically they're saying, don't hit dig here. There's something under the ground. We need to know that negative feelings that pop up can be like little red flags popping up that saying there's something under here. You need to pay attention to it to discern it and make wise choices. So we need to recognize that not all feelings indicate a root. Not all feelings have to... Uh, lead to confession or asking forgiveness five ways, but many do. Many, if we're, they're allowed to become emotions and that person's coming to you for prayer because they've already adopted ungodly beliefs and ungodly behaviors, then we'll need to lead them either in asking forgiveness five ways or tell them how to take those structures to the cross so that Jesus can bring them to death. Just covering them up with a positive confession does not work. Positive confessions are wonderful, but they do not take the place of confession of sin and are asking forgiveness. We need to do both. For instance, you would say, I was crazy if I said, after you murder someone, then you can make a positive confession that says, in Christ, <laughs> I have perfect love that casts out everyone's fears. Well, the positive confession might have sounded like a good move, but it's not going to make up for that murder. It's not going to get you forgiven or pardoned. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't have to be that extreme. So what do we do? We need to nip the, the, um, a negative or a, sin, a, a feeling that has a potential for sin. We need to nip it in the bud. We need to face it. We need to know that it's a red flag that's calling for attention or adjustment or better choices. We need to know that um, um, we need to go to God somehow. Now, if you're all by yourself and there's nothing to be done about that, then you can go to God in the best way for you, whether it's in prayer, whether it's through the Word. Or one thing that I would like to really recommend for those of you that <laughs> are having a particular hard time knowing how they're going to manage their emotions any better than they are now, is journaling. This is something that I have just started my 21st journal. <laughs> These little 6x9 notebooks that you used to be able to get from Walmart. Now I have to find a new source for them. But if you journal, if you go to God, like in Psalm 142, and you just pour out your heart honestly to Him, and say, Lord, I am feeling this. You know how David did when he, he wished they were dead? In fact, he wished before they died that their teeth were ground to powder, or he wished all these things that were not godly expressions of emotion and they weren't just a spontaneous feeling he was adopting ungodly beliefs about what he wanted to happen to people and ungodly behaviors that he would do at least in his mind if not be involved 
But by the end of those psalms, we see a pattern that David has poured out his heart to God. He's received the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He's received the truth of God. He's made the adjustments that he needs to make. And he's lining up with God's truth about himself, about people, about God's will, his ways, and his timing. Amen. So what I'd like you to do is to go to your handout and place something over the right side of your handout so that you can only see the options that are on the left. And pretend, for your homework, I would like you to pretend that you are in the side room and someone at church has come and asked you to pray for them in this side room. Or maybe you do have a couple of other people. Maybe they were wise enough to choose two or three selected friends and to ask them to come aside privately. And they are pouring these emotions out on you. And you can see the obvious indication that they're going to be in a position of looking to you to help them choose a negative belief or a negative behavior or to choose a godly belief or a godly behavior, a way to respond to these strong, strong emotions. And I would like you to just look over these without looking at the right side and then imagine or, better yet, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in how you would direct that person, what positive beliefs you would suggest, what godly behavior you would suggest to help them to learn how to make better choices in spite of strong negative emotions. I'll just go over the first one here with you. For instance, many people come in and they're just overwhelmed with feeling inadequate and inferior. If they don't feel like it's a sinister thing, you know, they're not afraid of going to jail or anything, but they begin to pour out the negative feelings, the negative expectations, and the negative beliefs. And as you listen to them, you hear something like this. Well, you know, if I try to step out, I'll just fail again. My family and friends just keep discouraging me. They know I can't do it. My contributions will be rejected anyway, as inferior. I never seem to have the money to make things work, and I have to meet people's expectations, and I can't. And the struggle is just too hard for me. I'm just a disappointment. I just hurt people when I try to do it, when someone else would be much better. I'm not trained or equipped, and if I fail, I'll lose God's approval too. And I don't have the gifts that I need, and I don't know why God would even ask me to do it in the first place. <laughs> well, that's some serious feeling inadequate and inferior, isn't it? But you and I have felt some of those things, too. So what do we choose to do? Obviously, some of those feelings have become emotions already, and they're being voiced as negative beliefs, and they're headed toward negative behavior of not obeying God, what He's asked them to do, not believing that they'll have what they need to do it, not believing that God's even on their side, much less anyone else and not believing in the value of what the Holy Spirit wants to do through them. So what will we do? How will we encourage them? How will we pray with them? Will we get into the ain't it awfuls and, and say, yeah, isn't it terrible how nobody's appreciated around here but Dick and so-and-so? Well, that would be pretty much agreeing with the negative beliefs and the behaviors that are here. It would be reinforcing their feeling of being adequate and inferior. I call that a feeling because... They're not inadequate and they're not inferior if they have the Holy Ghost inside them, amen? But what can we choose to believe? And what can we encourage them to choose to believe? How can we reinforce their positive emotions and positive feelings? And how can we deliver God's truth to them? Well, you can let them know that first of all, success isn't meeting someone else's standard. Success is stepping out in faith when God asks me to do something and believing that God's going to do it through me. Success is believing God's truth about my future instead of basing it on what's happened in the past. Maybe there have been some failures or near failures in the past, but we can choose to believe what God says about us and our future. Success is believing that I am valuable, I'm a contributing member of the team, and if God's asked me to do it, then there's value in it. God is going to do it through me. I can believe that God will provide for what He wants done through me instead of believing I won't have the money based on my natural resources already. God has 
For instance, let me interject this. God has told me that if he asks me to do something, that the money will come. That it's not presumption on my part. If he has asked me to do it, then I don't need to wait till I have all the money in my hand. I can begin to make steps in that direction, knowing that the money will come as I go. We can choose to believe that our self-worth is not based on the opinions of others, that our self-worth has been actually converted into a Christ worth, that Jesus has made us worthy by his death on the cross. It's not about our performance. It's not about what people think about our performance or even what we think about our performance, but Jesus has made us worthy. We can choose an emotion that would say that to obey God is to rest in Him and leave the results to Him. That if God asks me to do something, and sometimes He does ask me to do something, that in some people's eyes would be judged as a failure. Maybe they don't agree with me about what I'm called to do or, or how I would operate in a certain gift, and, and they wouldn't see it as a success. But I need to have a belief that says, that obedience and success in, in my rest is based on entering into what God wants me to do, doing it His way and His timing. We can encourage them to believe that God will provide the training. Maybe they aren't totally equipped yet, but, but God is in the process of equipping them and training them. And He will provide the teacher or the mentor or the helpmate or the support that they need to get the job done. Maybe they need to believe that God just simply loves them and is on their side, that God is nicer than they think, and He's not going to ask them to do something and have them walk out on a limb and just leave them there or laugh, but that He is in the business of stretching us and causing us to walk into a place where we will be more fulfilled as well as give Him glory. And we can help them believe that the Holy Spirit is inside them with every gift and every fruit there is, and so the the feeling that they're inadequate and inferior is not based on truth because when you have Jesus Christ, the fullness of the Godhead, or when you have the Holy Spirit who has all the gifts and all the fruit inside you, you have everything you need. And the Bible says we have everything we need for life and godliness. So is that an example of how a person comes in loaded down with negative feelings and negative emotions and we can begin to steer them toward godly beliefs and godly behaviors so that their emotions then are lined up with godly beliefs and godly behaviors or God's truth and they can go forward. Now they might still have a few negative feelings and I like what Joyce Meyer says. Anybody know what she says? Do it afraid. <laughs> we don't choose to be afraid. We don't choose to agree with the spirit of fear. The Bible always calls fear a spirit. We don't choose to agree with it, but every once in a while, just a fearful feeling or anxious feeling may pop back up. So don't condemn yourself. Know that feelings are just spontaneous. You cannot keep all feelings from popping up. Don't even make it as a goal. That's a formula for failure. But you can choose what your emotions are. And by definition, your emotion is what you allow to go on. You know, like David could have said, oh my word, I'm looking at another man's wife and quit looking and gone in the house. But instead, he allowed a, a motion that included lust, that included sin, that included an ungodly belief that he had the right to pull another man's wife into his own house for his own purposes. And so, instead of leaving that negative feeling alone and going on to something else, or if he needed to, uh, if he'd already entered into sin to renounce and repent and confess, he went on to let that negative, sinful emotion grow that included an ungodly belief and ungodly behavior. But we do have choices. We have the Holy Spirit in us, and we can choose to walk in the Spirit, and He will enable us to do it. So first of all, we won't go on guilt trips when we suddenly have what appears to be a negative feeling, but we will make choices to believe godly beliefs and godly behaviors, and to exercise and to keep confessing those so that we don't follow negative feelings. We don't allow feelings to control our choices. We need to acknowledge what our feelings are, to identify them specifically, but not make decisions, even if it appears that we need a little relief, not make decisions based on negative feelings. We need to choose godly beliefs and godly behaviors and base our emotion on truth, on freedom, on healing, on God's power. Amen. So I just want to pray for you that you will be one of those 
that will learn to express your feelings to others and to get that support and get that prayer. Lord, I just ask you to open our hearts to your Spirit's comfort, to the comfort that we can receive through other godly people. And we thank you for your Son, for your Holy Spirit that is there equipping us, enabling us, empowering us every step of the way. We thank you that you've experienced the full measure of every pain, every feeling, every emotion that we can possibly have. And we thank you that you've demonstrated to us how we can cry out to you. We can express ourselves honestly and openly, even our struggles and our challenges and our temptations. And that you have taken our negative sins, emotions, feelings um, on yourself. And even though we can't cast feelings out, <laughs> we can't be delivered of them, that you are there to transform us, to renew our minds, and to help us to make wise choices. So we, tonight we give you our blocks, we give you our fears, we give you our walls. We give you the areas where we thought we were supposed to close ourselves off, and we let our emotions become bound, and now we're lonely. We ask you to bring to us good listeners that will help us to pray the prayer to release our emotions, in a godly way. We ask you to make us a good listener that can pray for others, that can validate their feelings or emotions. We ask you to give us that openness that we can choose to be open and not fear being rejected, but we're willing to be ourselves so we can be accepted. And we ask you to help us to give other people permission to share their hearts freely. That we would be a model for them of how to be honest about who we are so that we can all make the right choices, how we can be free to be ourselves and to believe that you will love us and accept us and then we will allow others to be themselves right where they are and love and accept them where they are. And we just thank you, Lord, that you really want us to be free to be ourselves and that we can only start from where we are, but you will take us from where we are into truth, into godly beliefs, and into godly behavior. So we open our hearts to you and ask you to transform us, to renew our minds, to give us that heart of flesh like we talked about last week, that we can be genuine. We can be easy to know because we're willing to be a little vulnerable, a little bit more transparent. Sometimes it hurts, but that we can be that demonstration of your heart that is always honest, always loving, always accepting. And we thank you, Lord, that we will be the ones that people can come to when they're overwhelmed with negative feelings or negative emotions. And we thank you, Lord, for a heart of reconciliation and restoration for others. Amen.